Hi, um, so it's my pleasure today, today to introduce uh, Professor Naomi Ray. Uh, she is uh, she's somebody that's got a, a long track record of research uh, with and in Edinburgh. She obtained a BSc in Animal Science from the University of Edinburgh in 1984, uh, then before going to Cornell, and she then did her PhD in Quantitative Genetics at the University of Edinburgh before leaving in 2005. So Professor Naomi Ray works across two institutes within the University of Queensland. She's a National Health and Medical Research Council Principal Fellow and a Fellow of the Australian Academy of Sciences. Um, she focuses her, her efforts on the development of quantitative genetics and genomics methodologies with application to psychiatric and neurological disorders. She plays a key role in the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium, which is where uh, I, I, I have spent most of my time speaking to Naomi. And she's, had, uh, she's played a big part in the depression genetics effort as, as well as in the other disorders. So in, uh, earlier this year, Naomi and Patrick Sullivan, who, who is actually at the back of the lecture theatre today also, uh, led uh, a paper which reported 44 genome-wide significant loci for depression. This was a significant advance in the field that, is, that had been really hard to obtain any traction on the genetic architecture. So uh, appropriately, uh, Naomi is here in, I think, probably our most intimidating of venues uh, to speak <laughs> about the highs and lows of depression research. So th thank you very much, Naomi. Okay, thank you. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here, and uh, as Andrew said, I first came to Edinburgh in, uh, uh, I think, seven, uh, 37 years ago as an undergraduate, so um, it's uh, very interesting to be standing here as the person lecturing in this uh, very intimidating lecture theatre. Um, and I guess the take-home message for all the young scientists here is that my undergraduate degree was in, I was an agric, and uh, here I am talking about major depression. And so basically, um, you know, your career can go anywhere. Uh, so Andrew asked me to talk about uh, genetics of depression and to be honest I feel that that's a bit like bringing Coles to Newcastle. There's so much really good work going on in the genetics of depression here and we've had a really fantastic day already today, many of us um, hearing about the work that's going on here. But I guess the sorts of uh, research that we do these days really is at an interface of many dis different disciplines and research really needs a collaboration of people bringing different things to the table. And um, in our field it's about, uh, so in talking about depression it's about understanding the psychiatric traits, it's about understanding genetics, it's about understanding biology and it's about the statistics. And I suppose that what I bring to the table is more on the genetics and statistics side of, the, of, the, of this equation. And so you know, you've got me talking today, not other people. And so I'm going to be giving my tilt on things, which is more about understanding, thinking about the sort of underlying models which uh, contribute to our understanding of, of depression. But we are talking about depression, and so I'm just going to start with a few facts uh, just to really position ourselves to recognize that this is uh, such an important field for research. So firstly, uh, major depression means depressed mood or loss of interest or loss of pleasure in daily activities for more than two weeks. Uh, endorsement of at least five out of nine specific symptoms present nearly every day, and we'll be talking about some of those later on. Very high uh, lifetime risk, 15% uh, is a sort of a ballpark figure, some studies will estimate even more of that, uh, even higher than that. Uh, that means that every single one of us has either experienced or knows people uh, affected with depression. Male to female ratio, 2 to 1, 3% risk of, uh, lifetime risk of hospitalisation, 15% of patients treated with depression eventually die by suicide. Very very shocking statistic. But there is a, uh, an increased risk in relatives. So 15% uh, lifetime risk, uh, a higher risk in, in relatives of those affected. So perhaps uh, if you have a parent affected, then your lifetime risk, rather than being 15%, may be more like 25%. And that translates to having a heritability, so that means the proportion of variants attributable to genetic factors is 40%. But it's not just a genetic trait. We know that there's non-genetic factors, um, many different uh, uh, risks, uh, often uh, stressful life events in, in many different guises. There are many treatments, and many people do respond to treatment, but uh, the statistics suggest that 45% of people 
uh, don't respond to treatment. And many of us will know, anecdotally, through people we know are affected, that there often seems to be a trial and error allocation of, of drugs, that many people, when they're, they're diagnosed, they're um, uh, prescribed a drug, and there's, you have to maybe cycle through several to find the one that, that works for you. So all in all, we've got a disorder which is very common. If you, the health economics uh, are, are very impactful, something that certainly needs research. And so from this perspective that I work on is genetics, is to recognize that this isn't a disorder which is, is just, has just genetic uh, risk factors. But those of us who, who work in genetics have a kind of philosophy that we know that there's an increased risk to relatives. And if there's an increased risk to relatives, that means that these genetic factors are somehow hard-coded in the DNA that passes from parent to child. These DNA is, is present in every cell. If we can get to the genetic risk factors, then hopefully we're getting at maybe causal factors, something that might start a cascade. And so I've got a few little pictures there. So one is suggesting that you know, it might be a slow road, um, the tortoise, but it, maybe it's the tortoise that wins if we, if we actually try and dig down to the roots to, the, to understanding causes. So before talking about depression, I'm going to start with schizophrenia. Why schizophrenia? Because it's really the flagship disorder in psychiatric genetics. It's where we've mo made most progress. And so uh, by talking about schizophrenia, it enables us to make comparisons uh, with major depression. So schizophrenia is a much, more, um, much less common, uh, more severe psychiatric disorder, about 1% uh, lifetime risk, and a higher heritability, about up to 80%. And so what's happened in the last 10 years is our ability to uh, look at, directly look at, at DNA to uh, identify DNA variants which are associated with, uh, with a disease or disorder. So I'm sure many of you know about a genome-wide association study, but again, just like in our research, everybody comes with different skills. I expect here everybody comes with different uh, experiences, so I'll just go over that. And so this is where we recognize that there's 3 billion base pairs in our genome. About 10 million of these places vary between people. And so that's represented by these single nucleotide polymorphisms. And now with one of these uh, chips, which is only about this size, we can measure about 500 places that vary in, in our DNA. And it costs less than $50 a person. And because it's so cheap, we're now uh, doing these studies on uh, many thousands of people and for any disease or disorder that you've heard of. And so in a genome-wide association study, we're measuring these, say, 500,000 places that vary between people, and we're comparing cases versus the controls, and we're just looking in the genome to identify these DNA variants which are more common in cases than controls. And that's a, a genome-wide association study. We're looking for association across the whole genome. And so this is a timeline of discovery for, for uh, schizophrenia. So on the x-axis, we've got year, and on the y-axis, we've got number of risk loci identified. And we can see it starts back in 2006. So although that we, we knew for a long time that there's genetic factors associated with psychiatric disorders, back in 2006, despite many, many different genetic studies, there weren't really any genetic variants which had been uh, successfully replicated. But with the era of the genome-wide association studies, that started to change, so that by the end of 2014, with 35,000 cases, we'd identified more than 100 risk loci. And um, already that number is, uh, is, is almost dub is double that, actually, not yet published. And so we've gone from uh, knowing that there's genetic uh, risk factors associated with schizophrenia to actually identifying them. Uh, or identifying associations, which is really finding the tip of the iceberg, what we found the iceberg. It's allowing us to uh, take those results forward. Uh, and so this is another way to present those results. This is a Manhattan plot. So on the x-axis, we've got chromosome and position on the chromosome. And on the y-axis, we've got a, a p-value, a minus log 10 p-value, so a measure of the degree of association uh, with different uh, of these polymorphisms in, in the DNA. 
And so all the red uh, towers are showing the, the loci that are associated. So 108 of those in that paper published for schizophrenia in 2014. So I tried to give my talk a bit of a trendy title by saying ups and downs. And so this was one of the low points for major depression because our paper in 2012 where we tried to uh, undertake one of these studies had 9,000 cases and about 9,000 controls and we didn't identify any loci associated with major depression. And at that point, many people in our field said, oh, major depression is much too heterogeneous, you're not going to find anything, it's not worth doing it with depression, just give up. And you might say, well, maybe it's to do with sample size. So we have got 35,000 cases, only 9,000 cases for, for uh, major depression. But this was the paper, paper, uh, the paper published in 2001 for schizophrenia. That did have 9,000 cases that identified five loci, uh, and you can see that the, the, the towers are, are much more impressive already there for schizophrenia than for major depression. And so while we had Manhattan for, for schizophrenia, it was really more like Holland for, for major depression. But one of the problems at that point when people were saying uh, this isn't going to work for depression is that they had in their mind that all genetic studies are created equal, that if you've got 10,000 cases for schizophrenia, that that's the same as 10,000 cases for major depression. <coughs> and so some of the work I did early on was to, to actually re-evaluate that. And so to understand those calculations, we have to think about how we might model disease. And so um, the way in which we think about complex disease and schizophrenia and major depression we now know are complex diseases is to think about a polygenic model for disease. And so that is to say that um, before these genetic studies we thought that uh, these diseases might be polygenic. With data we, can, we have shown that schizophrenia is polygenic. <coughs> that means we've identified many genetic loci. We think that major depression is very likely to be polygenic as well. So a polygenic model, uh, we, we, the one way that we think about that is to think about an underlying liability for disease which is normally distributed. Why would it be normally distributed? Because it's underpinned by many, many factors. Many genetic factors and many non-genetic factors. And we know that when there's many things contributing to something, we, we usually end up with a normal distribution. So just in case you don't believe that, just, let's just work through that a little bit. Let's imagine a single locus which has got three genotypes. Um, and we know the three genotypes, uh, we have two homozygotes, the little a, little a, and the big A, big A, and a heterozygote, big A, little a. And the risk locus is the big A. And so at a single uh, uh, place, we've got either zero, one, or two risk alleles. So zero if you're little a, little a, two risk alleles if you're big A, big A. And we can think, okay, so this is what happens with our, with our one locus. We've got those three genotypes, and we've either got zero, one, or two risk alleles. And that's the, the, the distribution that they might show in the population. If we've got two loci, when you've got two loci, then um, <coughs> with two homozygotes uh, with risk alleles, you might have act up to four risk alleles. And so then uh, the phenotypes that we can see are 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4 risk alleles. Um, and you see a, a distribution that they show. And then we can e increase to three and four loci. And again, think about the number of risk alleles that we'd have with four loci. That means uh, ranging from either 0 to 8 in the distribution. And you can see, with, simply with four uh, risk, risk loci, we've already got a, a normal distribution in the count of risk alleles. This is a slightly idealized situation where I've imagined that effect sizes are the same for all uh, risk alleles. And in this example, I've assumed that the risk allele frequency is 50%. But we can very easily um, relax those assumptions and in almost any situation that you can think of, is when you get more than 20 or 30 risk alleles, you end up with this normal distribution of count, count of risk alleles. And so it's, it's plausible that um, this polygenic model uh, is representative of, of disease. And so I did some calculations to say, well, let's think about schizophrenia compared to major depression. So we, here we have our distributions of liability. 
And we've got uh, their schizophrenia about 1% one one lifetime risk, so that's the, the red proportion at the, the top of that distribution. And major depression much more common, say 15%, you can see a, a much bigger proportion in, in that distribution. And when we take our genome-wide association studies, we're tending to take equal numbers of cases and controls, um, which is represented in the bottom where we do our oversampling of, of cases versus and controls. And basically, the difference in, in mean liability between cases and controls is actually much bigger for schizophrenia because it's a less common disease. And so, with that sort of modelling, you can work out that just simply accounting for that difference in, in lifetime risk, that we would actually need uh, sample sizes two to three times bigger for major depression compared to schizophrenia. We can then also say, well, why would we expect... Uh, yeah, at, at the baseline, I would expect the same number of risk alleles for, for major depression than schizophrenia, maybe even more, but just a baseline, the same number. If we assume the same number, we know that the heritability for schizophrenia is much higher than it is for, for major depression. If we take that into the account in the, uh, in the calculations, then we work out that we need sample sizes four to five times bigger for major depression compared to schizophrenia. And so when, when I first put forward these calculations, a lot of people said, oh no, that's terrible, we can't do anything. Uh, much too, the sample sizes we need are much too big. But, but why should we say that? It's a much more common disorder. It should be, be easy to find these samples. But once people have got over that hesitation, we have managed to move forward and get much larger sample sizes. So this is then a, a slightly different way of presenting uh, the schizophrenia uh, uh, curve I showed you um, of discovery. This is actually from one of Pat's papers where on the x-axis we've got sample size in times of thousands of cases and on the y-axis we've got the number of genome-wide significant loci. And so this was comparing height, which was the green line with schizophrenia. It's also got bipolar disorder on there and Crohn uh, and inflammatory bowel disease. So inflammatory bowel disease, we needed uh, fewer cases. That's up partly because it's a less common disorder, partly reflecting uh, genetic architecture. But if we superimpose our major depression results onto this graph, uh, this is what we have now. As Andrew said as his, in his introduction, uh, this year we published a paper for major depression where we've identified 44 loci. And if we kind of uh, join those two uh, lines up, we realize that, the, that uh, this prediction of a five-fold increase actually fits very well to the data. So this is the Manhattan plot from our paper, which was published uh, this year, uh, 44 loci. So how did we, and that was with 135,000 cases. So how did, we, how did we get to such a big sample size? Um, we got to this sample size firstly by standard uh, researchers bringing together their clinical or research cohorts. And this is represented here. These are 29 different cohorts that we had. Uh, the blue bars are cases and the orange bars are controls. But then we put them together with other data sets. And so now on the left-hand side, the PGC29 is all of those samples on the left-hand side combined together. And then we used uh, data from DECODE. So that's the Icelandic population, Generation Scotland, from here, from here of course. JIRA, which is a, um, an insurance company database from the States. ISIC, which is the Danish national data. And um, the UK Biobank first uh, wave. And the thing to notice then is just the, the difference in sample sizes, is how we could uh, get, uh, leverage much bigger sample sizes by going to essentially different types of data collections than, than the classical um, cohorts that had been accumulated through research. But the way in which we really ac uh, accumulated sample sizes was by uh, joining up with 23andMe. So 23andMe had published a paper themselves in 2016 and had identified 15 loci. And so on the left-hand side now, that's our total sample size from all those data sets uh, pulled together. And then in the middle is a sample size from 23andMe. 
and on the right hand side is the data set uh, uh, combined uh, giving our, uh, our 135,000 cases. And so our final data set was a meta-analysis of all these, these cohorts. And one of the problems was the, the uh, data set from 23andMe, as many of you all know, is uh, self-report questionnaires. And the sorts of questions they had were, have you ever been diagnosed by a doctor uh, with major depression? Uh, have you ever been diagnosed with clinical de depression? These are from different questionnaires. Um, so single questions and uh, many people in the consortium were concerned that this single question phenotype was not going to be representative of the major depression that has been recorded in the clinic and that's a very important concern and so uh, we had to address that and so one way, one way to address that is through out of sample prediction and so that means we can take a genome wide association study which is our discovery sample um, identify uh, genetic factors associated with, uh, in this case, major depression, and then take those identified risk factors in a totally independent sample called a target sample, and uh, simply uh, make a, a sum of the account of the risk alleles, a weighted sum perhaps by the effect size, uh, of all the people in that target sample. And so the, then you end up with a, a distribution of these uh, polygenic risk scores. And then we can compare those, those risk scores and evaluate them and say, are those risk scores higher for cases than, than controls in that target sample? So that's what we did. Um, so we took as our discovery sample either uh, just 23andMe or the full meta-analyzed sample. And we, in this example, have three target samples which are totally independent. They were um, either a, a clinical sample from Munster which uh, wasn't included at all in our, our analysis, uh, or, which is the green bar, or there were samples which were included in our analysis but that we left them out of the discovery sample for this particular analysis. And uh, then the orange bar is when the iPsych Danish study was left out. And the iPsych Danish study is a, is a national uh, study with, uh, based on uh, uh, the hospital records. And so what you can see there is um, variance explained on the y-axis and then above each bar the uh, p-value for the association of the, this polygenic risk score in each of these uh, cohorts. And what we can see is that although 23andMe uh, was based on a single question, it was predictive in uh, these independent uh, out-of-sample cohorts. And that when we meta-analyzed, the prediction uh, in out-of-sample out of sample prediction increased. Um, and we could take that forward by uh, some of our cohorts were, had uh, data which was uh, about severity of major depression in different forms. And so, for example, we could see that our out-of-sample prediction was uh, higher for people with early-onset depression, which we think is a more severe form. It was higher for, uh, in a cohort which had, which had recorded moderate compared to severe with a higher risk prediction for severe. Uh, another cohort had single versus recurrent, and again, the prediction was higher in recurrent. And another co cohort had um, another measure of severity based on staging. Again, the risk predictions were higher for uh, the, the more severe stages. So we felt that based on this, uh, the single question uh, was useful in terms of measuring major depression and that meta-analysis was justified and that I think it's reasonable to say that people are aware if they have depression and they're able to, to self-report. So another question that we can say with these, uh, our results from our major depression genome-wide association study are, do these results mean anything? And so we, we looked at that in, in different ways. And so we have our, our, our results where we have associations between our DNA variants, our single nucleotide polymorphisms, their associations with, with depression, and we can annotate those to genes. 
And then we can take totally <coughs> independent data where uh, we have gene expression measured on different tissues and we can look at the level of gene expression in those different tissues. And then we can match those two different types of data together. And what we see when we do that analysis here, um, you probably can't see all the words, but these are different uh, tissue types and it's looking for how our signal of association with depression is enriched for genes expressed um, in different tissue types. And there we see that uh, the brain tissues uh, have the highest enrichment and go above the vertical, past the vertical line of, of uh, significant association. So on the one hand you can say, well what's that telling us, that major depression is a brain disorder, but it's um, validation that we're, we're starting to see results which make sense. And we're in a, in a stage where there's more and more data becoming available. And uh, whereas on this slide it was looking at gene expression of uh, tissues, uh, technology is allowing us to measure gene expression not just in tissues, which are a mix of many different cells, but to measure gene expression in single cells. And so this was data generated actually by Pat Sullivan's group uh, where we were able to match our associations for depression with gene expression in, in different types of brain cells and showing an enrichment for expression in particular, uh, particular cell types. So these are, these are uh, data sets which are going to become, uh, these gene expression data sets are going to become uh, more and more interesting over time and so these analyses I think are going to become uh, more and more useful. So this is annotation which has been based on uh, levels of mean gene expression. There's other analyses where we can actually look at uh, variation in uh, gene expression and also map that together with the results from our, uh, our genetic studies of depression, but I'm not going to talk about that now. So then we can also say, um, do these results mean anything uh, uh, by looking at relationships with other diseases? And so these are results where we're looking at genetic correlations between uh, many traits and major depression is, is one of those traits. I don't know if um, so major depression is third from the bottom. And so again this is a reflection of what we can do these days with genetic studies where uh, we've, I think we've been interested for a long time to understand genetic relationships with diseases, but with standard epidemiology it's actually very hard to work out which ge diseases are genetically related to each other. Because in standard uh, epide epidemiology to work out genetic relationships you have to collect very large cohorts of people who are measured for two diseases and their relatives. So you, to estimate genetic correlation in traditional ways you collect large cohorts of uh, individuals with a disease and then look at the frequency of another disease in their family members. And that means that that, ha that actually hasn't been done very much. We, before um, the era of the last 10 years, we really didn't know about genetic relationships between diseases. So this is showing results from these genome-wide association studies which has been applied to many diseases and disorders and we're able to say are the genetic associations with one disease uh, correlated with the genetic associations with another disease. And so um, this, so the take home message here is that the uh, depression is uh, more similar to the other psychiatric disorders uh, than to, to other traits. And so again that's showing that we are picking up uh, uh, relevant signals in our genetic studies of, of depression. So in the paper we went into much more investigation of our results but you know, to be perfectly honest uh, that, that study is still underpowered. That, you know, we found 44 loci, we know that this is the beginning and I know that already results from Edinburgh, um, latest analyses from here have already made that number much higher and I think that um, as data sets accumulate we're going to get even more 
associations. And when we get a very large number of associations, that's when it's going to be very, very interesting to really uh, drill into the, the biology. Um, and we can see from our results that already that I think that we would um, identify uh, more associations. So that's uh, the Manhattan plot where you can start to see towers which are um, not reaching the line of significance that's, that's going a, a, across uh, the red line. And another way to look at that is through this QQ plot where we have, um, where we're looking at the uh, expected associations on the x-axis and the observed associations on the y-axis. And so uh, the black line is what we've observed with real data. The blue line is what we, you would expect under uh, the null hypothesis of no, no association. And so you can see we have a very massive deviation from that uh, null line of no association. These uh, represent the 44 loci which, were, um, which passed our level of uh, significance. And, uh, but there's a lot more, uh, uh, there's a signal there where that line of observation is very much raised above the line of expectation, which is evidence that we know that there are many more uh, genetic variants that are associated. We just need larger sample sizes to identify them. So in this slide, I, I have what I call a summary of genetic studies of the last decade. It comes from a review in Nature Neuroscience in 2016. And so on the x-axis, we've got proportion of variation attributable to common genetic risk factors. Well, a pro proportion of variation attributable to genetic risk factors. And the green bars are those attributable to the common genetic risk factors which have been identified in, in these genome-wide association studies. Um, and the brown bars are representative of variants which are associated with uh, de novo mutations. And as you can see on the x-axis, we've got different psychiatric disorders, starting with intellectual dis disability that's, that's severe, uh, and going down to Alzheimer's disease. So these are kind of ordered in um, age of onset. And what we see is that the de novo mutations are much more likely to occur in these disorders which are diagnosed in childhood. So it's not that we haven't looked for these de novo mutations. So de novo mutation is when uh, a, a DNA variant which is not present in the parents but is new in the child. So every single one of us carries about 60 mutation, new mutations in our DNA which weren't present in our parents. Um, and but sometimes those new, new, new mutations land in places where there's, uh, uh, it has a very big impact on, on phenotype. And so basically if you have a new mutation which has, has got a big impact, then it's likely that you're going to be diagnosed, uh, you're going to present with a, a much more severe phenotype um, and, and, the, and, and then end up with a, a diagnosis with, uh, given in childhood rather than a diagnosis uh, in adulthood. Um, so, what was that? so, this is really showing that the, uh, the evidence across many psychiatric disorders is that they are polygenic. The green bars is showing that contribution from common variants, which is a signal of uh, many genetic variants of small effect. But there's still a difference between that proportion of variation which is, uh, uh, we have identified, well we haven't yet identified, we can see the signal in, in the genome. That, uh, that proportion is still smaller than the, than, than the heritability that we have estimated from family studies. And we call that missing heritability. So, for example, the heritability for schizophrenia is about 60, 70, 80 percent, but the proportion of variants which is attributable to, to these common genetic factors is um, uh, there, it's saying 40 percent. I would say it's probably even less than that, 30 percent. And similarly with depression, we estimate the heritability of depression to be 40 percent, 
but um, common genetic factors are only explaining 10 to 15 percent. And my impression is that for diseases, this missing heritability is actually uh, bigger than for quantitative traits. And so for quantitative traits, um, so like height is a classic one in, in genetics we think about. And, and so we can ask ourselves, is this, is this true? Is, is there more missing heritability for disease than for quantitative traits? And if there is, well, what are the explanations? One is genetic architecture. So that means that there may be, um, our genome-wide association studies are only uh, looking at variants which are, are common in the population. Um, and it's quite likely that um, diseases and disorders, psychiatric disorders, have a, a higher contribution from the rare variants which haven't yet been um, identified. So possibly it's about genetic architecture. Possibly it's about assumptions of method methodology. But possibly it's also technical artifacts. And I think the first two of these explanations are likely to be true. But I think we don't pay enough attention to the third one, to the technical artifacts. And so this is, uh, these are some results thinking about cohort size in quantitative traits. And so this is thinking, looking at height and BMI. And um, uh, for... The two big studies uh, for these traits, Wood et al. from 2014 uh, and Locke et al. from 2015. So the Wood et al. identified 594 DNA variants associated with height, uh, and the Locke et al. one for BMI identified 82. And these are from our standard genetic studies that we have accumulated over the last 10 years, which are really... Uh, researchers from around the world having their cohorts, bringing them together and meta-analyzing. In contrast, we can take a sample size of exactly the same size as these ones now from the UK Biobank. So the UK Biobank is a, a single cohort, um, uh, and many of you will know, 500,000 people in, in the UK uh, measured for many different traits, collected in the same way, uh, genotyped in the same way, many, many things much more consistent than, uh, and, than the uh, standard uh, studies that we brought together for, for meta-analysis. And so we take exactly the same sample size from the UK Biobank as for Wood et al. and get 850 loci associated with, with height compared to the 594 in the Wood et al. And similarly for BMI, when we take exactly the same sample size as for Locke et al., and take that, say, that uh, random sample out of the UK Biobank, uh, we identify 160 loci compared to 82. And so what I think this is telling us is that very large cohorts collected in a consistent way can deliver much more. And I think if that's what we're seeing with quantitative traits, I'm sure it's what we'll be seeing. It's going to be uh, even more, more important in binary traits that we think about how we collect single large cohorts uh, to overcome some technical things. Um, and so just reminding, um, uh, these are the data sets which went into our major depression study and just uh, how our standard way of collecting cohorts uh, which is the PGC clinical research cohorts, uh, are, are really relatively small. And I think that we have to start thinking about ways in which we can uh, collect larger cohorts for, uh, for disease studies. Because, of course, the UK Biobank um, is actually uh, 500,000 people. We do have a, a proportion of uh, people with depression, but other diseases are not well represented there. So another thing that we, uh, I, I like to think of is, is this slide here, which comes from a paper that we did in 2015. It was using a method called Bazar, and it was analyzing mostly, uh, these were data sets actually from the Wellcome Trust Case Control Consortium. But it was a methodology that allows, it, it, for me it gives a very nice visualization of genetic architecture of different uh, traits. Uh, having used the same methodology. And in fact, for 
uh, all these studies except for the schizophrenia one, the same control samples were used. And so what this uh, graph shows is um, a comparison of uh, polygenic architecture across these different diseases. And so we see for uh, type 1 diabetes, uh, so, we've got the, so on the x-axis we've got chromosome number and on the y-axis we've got variance explained. We've got uh, all effect sizes are small, but the uh, red is showing small effect sizes, uh, green medium ex effect sizes, and then blue bigger effect sizes. And so um, type 1 diabetes and rheumatoid arthritis, we see big spikes on chromosome 6. That's because we have uh, variants which on the MHC locus, which are, which are very big. Um, but for me, the take-home message is looking at those two psychiatric disorders at the bottom and realizing that actually there's not much blue and not much green there compared to those other disorders. In other words, those, uh, the psychiatric disorders are looking much, much, much more polygenic even than, than other complex traits. Uh, major depression isn't there, but I can, I'm totally confident it would look very red in, in this uh, representation. And so then you can think to yourself, well, um, are psychiatric disorders really different or could something else be going on? And it could be that they're different. It could be that they are truly uh, poly, much more polygenic. Uh, but it could be that um, because diagnosis isn't as good uh, or because it's uh, based on uh, subjective uh, self-report or clinical uh, interpretation of somebody's self-report that maybe there's other heterogeneity going on and could that be um, generating those results. And so back in 2014 I did a bit of a toy example to try and think of this and so I said let's imagine that we've got two biologically distinct disorders which are polygenic so we can represent them at the top with um, uh, normal distribution of liability with uh, uh, the two diseases, blue and red. But the way that they present to us is that they are phenotypically indistinguishable. So it looks like a higher proportion and, uh, of a distribution which is colored yellow. And so then we can say, well, in this toy example, if those two diseases, those two biologically distinct, distinct diseases had a lifetime risk of half a percent and a heritability of 80%, if we were to actually, but when they were combined together and the way they present, they would look to us like they had a lifetime risk of 1% because we can't tell them apart when they look like a disease of 1%. If you work through the maths and think about it, the way in which we estimate heritability with this, this conglomerate disease, which is actually two diseases, the way in which we estimate heritability from uh, observational studies from increased risk to relatives, we'd actually estimate a heritability uh, which was very high. I worked it out, you'd estimate the heritability was, would be 65%. So it looked to us like a disease that's very, very highly heritable just because the way in which, which we estimate the heritability is based on, on first degree relatives. But if we were to actually uh, do a genome-wide association study and estimate SNP heritability, then we would estimate a much lower proportion uh, of SNP heritability in this, this bottom example where they're combined together and we can't pull them apart compared to if we had uh, two biologically distinct disorders. And so it's just a toy, a toy example of thinking about the underlying um, models that, could gener that uh, might explain our results through heterogeneity. And today we've heard um, about different uh, data analyses which are, are trying to address that hypothesis. So major depression has, uh, uh, is is based on, uh, to get a diagnosis of major depression, you have to endorse uh, at least five out of nine of these uh, criteria for, for depression. And so that in itself, so these are nine, uh, nine items and five or more of them have to be endorsed for this uh, diagnosis of depression, which necessarily means that uh, 
those people diagnosed with depression may have different combinations of, of symptoms. And even within these nine symptoms, three of them, the ones I've highlighted in red, are uh, changes uh, in, in either weight and appetite, so it could be up or down, changes in sleep, either high or uh, more or less, changes in, in activity, either more or less. So a lot of heterogeneity is built into our um, diagnostic system. And this is looking at those questions for our PGC cohorts. And uh, uh, maybe in this lecture hall, you can see, see all these different, uh, different nine items. So on the x-axis, we've got different cohorts. On the y-axis, we've got the uh, endorsement rates. And the, just, I just wanted to give you an impression of these are clinically collected cohorts, hopefully with consistent, um, uh, uh, using the same diagnostic criteria, but the take-home message is just, just how much heterogeneity there actually is in, the, in, um, in these endorsement rates, which is just inherent in these data sets. So what I've tried to say is I think that we will have more discovery with major depression if we have larger data sets, that <coughs> heterogeneity might be a problem, uh, that technical artifacts might be a problem. So how do we actually go about collecting larger cohorts? So one of the things that we've tried to do in Brisbane um, back in Australia is uh, we launched a study which is an online questionnaire and we advertised it through, this is Nick Martin, many of you know, he went on TV, he likes to do that sort of thing. And uh, within a very short space of time, we recruited 15,000 people onto the online questionnaire. And uh, we sent them spit kits, they sent them back. And uh, we, as I say, it's a very large sample in a short space of time, a 45 minute questionnaire online with lots and lots of, of rich data. So um, that was our way to try and, and, and address that problem. To ultimately, I don't think it's, uh, I think we have to do more than that. I think on, we have to actually get better data through uh, clinical collections. But this is a, a very cheap way. This was only a, a, a million dollar study uh, to, to generate this data. And one of the things that we have in that questionnaire is actually uh, questions about response to treatment. So this is uh, a, a, a figure from a paper published in The Lancet this year, which is looking at uh, how well different uh, antidepressants <coughs> work. And within our questionnaire, we have uh, specifically asked people which antidepressants work for you and which ones don't. And this is um, the results of that. Uh, showing, uh, I think, very interesting data on, on variation uh, between in responses um, for different antidepressants. And so we have some people who are saying uh, very clearly that one antidepressant works for them and another one doesn't. And so when we ge get our genetic data, uh, we're going to be looking at that. So I'm going to end with just a little bit, of, again, about thinking about modelling of disease and thinking about this polygenic model of disease uh, where we have our phenotypic liability and we think uh, we model disease by thinking uh, that those at the tail end of the distribution are, are, are those that have disease. Now some people don't seem to like this model but they prefer this sort of model where you say this is the genetic liability on the x-axis and we've got probability of disease on the y-axis and so as your genetic liability increases um, uh, increases uh, your probability of disease suddenly goes up, up steeply and it's not a, not a hard threshold on phenotypic liability or not, not a hard threshold on phenotypic liability but these two are ex actually exactly the same model they're just different ways of, of presenting it and so another take home message is to say that under a polygenic model we think that genetic effects uh, are acting additively, but for disease, actually what that means in, in, on, a, on a having disease or not having disease basis is it's actually very highly non-additive. Um, but it doesn't make, s but the reason, but, but let me talk about it a different way. So what does that mean for an individual? So what does, we, th we often think about polygenicity in this way, but what does it actually mean for an individual? 
And so to try and explain polygenicity for an individual, I use this cartoon. So this is saying, imagine we have a disease, a toy example of um, that a disease is controlled by 100 risk loci. And uh, so each of these squares represents the kind of genome of an individual. These big squares represents the genome of an individual. And I've broken that into, uh, their genomes into, uh, there's 100 risk loci, so there's 100 little squares for each person. And I've colored those little squares white if there's no risk alleles, blue if there's one risk allele, or two if the, red if there's two risk alleles. And each of these risk alleles has a frequency of 10%. And so what I'm showing you here is that um, uh, with that scenario, 100 risk alleles, frequency of 10%, two alleles at each locus, we can say that on average a person carries 20 risk alleles. So for any common disease, every single one of us is carrying risk alleles. Uh, but the set at the top are, are cases, and so in this example, I think I've got a heritability of about 50% uh, and about 1% of the population has got disease. And so what you can take home from this is, really it's a visualization to recognize that every single one of us is carrying risk alleles, that uh, there's almost a unique combination of risk alleles, that anyone who, who is affected um, with disease is likely to have a unique combination. And so, I think I've got all that there. And so, it's really a visualization just to make us realize that this, the, when we talk about a polygenic disease, and we, we talk about it as a, in a very homogeneous way of, you know, many risk alleles, each of small effect, what that means for an individual is that every individual uh, is, has, has got a different, unique combination of those. And that is also why we need large samples for identifying those risk alleles, because every single one of these risk alleles is carried by, by uh, people who aren't affected by disease either. Um, so tomorrow some of us are going to a symposium which is about R.A. Fisher, who is the statistician um, who in 1918 published a very important paper for genetics uh, who uh, recognized how we could explain polygenic disease, polygenic traits um, from thinking about uh, the accumulation of individual loci, as, as I talked about earlier on. And so, 1918, he, he really proposed these underlying models of uh, quantitative genetics, which um, underpin most, uh, a lot of our thinking in research. <coughs> Uh, but it wasn't until 1953 that we discovered DNA, not till many years after that we could measure anything in D DNA. And so there was a long period where there was a lot of um, very clever people working on genetic models, but you couldn't actually measure anything. And so when I did my PhD, it was the time of the end of um, uh, genetic selection experiments. And so because you couldn't measure things in DNA, there was a whole period in genetics departments where selection experiments were set up to demonstrate um, that the theory, the mathematical theory that had been derived, uh, would, made sense and worked. And so this is, uh, I think it's a figure from this paper from Bill Hill, who's also here in, in Edinburgh. And the title of his paper is, Can More Be Learned From the Selection Experiments? or is it time for, for an obituary? And he concluded that we had learned everything that we needed to learn from a selection experiment. But my feeling is that um, a lot of people now don't think about these experiments and don't uh, think about the implications of them. And so these experiments were set up to test theory and to really understand genetic architecture and selection limits. But, um, so what, the, what we've got here is a selection experiment over many generations, and you can see from the starting point, there'd be very little variation between people in that base population, but you can select very intensely for a long period of time, and the, the uh, phenotype goes up and up and up. And it's not that uh, genes probably are going to fixation, it's just different combinations of variants. It was a demonstration that polygenicity was really working and that after uh, halfway through, you could then select down, which is the green line, and you could get back to the beginning. So again, genetic variants hadn't been lost. 
So why is this important? I think it's important because it really helps to understand polygenicity if you actually think about how that works, how you can have so much selection response uh, and, um, and not run out of genetic variation. And so I think it comes to this one equation. And so for me, this is the one equation which is really about understanding polygenicity. And it's a very simple equation. For me, this is going to be the E equals MC squared for genetics. Um, so if we think about genetic variation of population, we can think about a generation of parents and we can think about a gener generation of their children. And it makes sense that the genetic variation in the parent generation is the same as in the children generation. But we know, uh, so this is an equation where you can say the genetic value of a child, we know children get their DNA from their parents, half from their mum, half from their dad. And we can write the, that as the genetic value of the child is the average of the genetic values of their parents, then a deviation from that, which is the segregation variance. It's the particular combinations that they get. So every child gets exactly half the genetic values from their mum, exactly half the genetic values from their dad, but each child in a family gets a different half, and so there's that segregation terms. We kind of take it for granted in humans because we don't have very big families. This is a big family from Utah, a mum and a dad with many children, and you can see we, take, we can see that they're very similar, but we, um, uh, and we take it for granted that they're all different. So then if, uh, if you think about the variance, so we can take the variance of that equation, um, and if you work through the sums, then you can work out what the variation of that segregation term is. So what's the variation that's coming within a family? Very simple if you just work it, step it through. Um, we're assuming that mums and dads aren't correlated, no associative mating. That segregation variance is independent of the average of the mums and dads because it's an independent sampling. And so what you work out, and this is the E equals MC squared equation for genetics, that half the genetic variation in a, in a family, um, it, half the genetic variation in a population comes within families. So in other words, if you take a, a mum at random and a dad at random and you allowed them to have a thousand children, then you'd see a massive amount of genetic variation. Half the genetic variation comes within that one family. Um, uh, half of the genetic variation in the population is in, in one family. In other words, we've got a massive amount of genetic variation hidden in our genomes. And it's understanding that is the key to understanding polygenicity. And it's very hard to explain that in a very short lecture, but here's a test. Um, this is a test to see if you understand polygenicity. Let's imagine we have a disease which has a lifetime risk of 1%, heritability of 80%. And then I say to you, well, so this is a disease which is very highly heritable, 80%. Does it make sense to you that the, if you have a, co a, a twin that's affected with the disease, that the probability of disease in the co-twin is less than 50%? So think about that. Very, very highly heritable disease, 80%. The probability of disease in a monozygotic co-twin is less than 50%. Very heritable disease those affected have no known family history, no one else in their family has been affected 65% of the time. Think about those, so those statements make sense to you. If they do, that means you understand polygenicity, if not, then you need to go and read up about it, because that's, that's the key. And I, it, they're not intuitive, that's the thing, they're not intuitive, but they, they make sense when you understand polygenicity. And it's really all to do with the fact that You've got a polygenic disease, but only a small proportion of the people, uh, people in the population affected. And, and uh, that's what makes it non-intuitive. So polygenicity is very, very consistent with biological rob robustness. That is that um, really we've evolved systems where we're very uh, robust to, to mutations. And um, it's only when many, many things uh, are happening at the same time do you move into a disease state. So um, now I've come to the end of my hour, but at the end of the day, what we're really interested in, in uh, when we're studying complex disease, particularly major depression, is thinking about how to take those, our genetic discoveries through to new drugs and new preventions. But we also talk about precision medicine, which is about working out which drugs go to which people. And so when you think back to my, um, my visualizations of polygenicity, what that means for an individual, 
I think we also have to be thinking much more about uh, patient stratification, much more about collecting data of response to treatment. So um, uh, I've tried to cover, I think, too much uh, in an hour to, um, and I feel it hasn't really made much, perhaps as much sense as I wanted it to, but some take-home messages. Major depression is like any other complex disease. It was only five years ago when people said it was a waste of time trying to do genetic studies. We've proved that wrong. I've tried to show very quickly that the results do make sense and that as I think as larger sample sizes come forward, we will, um, uh, uh, things will, uh, we're going to make a, a lot more progress. Despite the heterogeneity, when we, uh, we can uh, get over the heterogeneity with large sample sizes, but I do think that to penetrate that heterogeneity, we really want large sample sizes together with very uh, detailed phenotyping information. Um, uh, and really, as I say, the key to understanding polygenicity is understanding how much gene genetic variation is hidden in our genomes. And uh, my work has been on major depression is really part of this major, uh, major depression consortium, which has been led by Pat Sullivan and my team in Brisbane uh, led a, a lot of those analyses. This is our team in Brisbane, standing in a height distribution. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, we, we co-lead a group, Peter Vischer, Jan Yang and I. And lastly, I'm co-chairing a conference in Brisbane in 2020, which is the International Congress of Quantitative Genetics. So plan ahead and come and visit us. Thank you.